Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. Maybe you're watching this on Sunday morning. Maybe you're watching it on Saturday night. In fact, you might not even be in the country. You could be in a whole different place in a different time zone. And uh, we're think, just... I think we're in a time zone all our own Or right a time now. warp. <laughs> <laughs> our kids are in bed and it's going on midnight here. It's our only quiet time in our house. So... So that's our time zone. <laughs> that's right. And uh, we're glad that you joined us for wherever you are and whatever the time is. Well, and we're excited about this Sunday because it's Baptism Sunday at church and our oldest boy, Skylar, is getting baptized and, and some other youth. Um, and so it's a really good day. So why don't you join us as we do a few songs, kind of geared a little bit around baptism, and, and we're just going to have a good time. All right. <laughs> been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Bridegroom comes, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bride? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Right. Well, here's an old one, but we just love singing this one to the river.
a scripture passage that has just been going over and over in my mind lately has been, um, and it's one of my favorites all through the years, but especially recently, is from Isaiah 43. And it says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fires, you will not be burned, nor the flames scorch you, for I am the Lord your God. And you know, it just makes me think of of times I know for Kevin and I where we have had the unexpected and had some of that hard and felt like we were walking through the fire. And you know what? I'm so glad to be able to say, having come through it, and I look back and I know, God, you kept your promises. You were with us. You never left us. And to be able to say, you know, even after some of the challenges and the things that we maybe wonder or question about, and be able to say, God, you are faithful. You are good. And it is amazing to experience God in this way. And I pray that you are in that place today where you're just knowing um, and you have confidence that God is good. And that you could sing along with this next song. I will sing of the goodness of God. And you will know deep in your heart, yes, this is true. He is a faithful and good God. Surrender. 
surrendered now I give you everything Your goodness is running after Running after me And all my life you have been Well, good morning, and just uh, want to welcome you to our online service video for this Sunday. Thank you to Kevin and Kim for sharing, uh, for leading us in, in worship and in those songs this morning. Um, they always do that in such a wonderful way, and we're really blessed by their, by their ministry to all of us uh, this morning. Well, these days I kind of always have to start my, these videos, or, or at least my part of these videos, with, uh, with just a few things to share with you about our, the life of our church and some things that I just want to make sure you're aware of and that you can be planning for. So the first one is just, just to remind you that, that today, this Sunday, on, uh, on September 27th, we are having a baptism. We have five of our teens from our church and our youth ministry who are, who are going to be baptized today. Um, the, we've attached the, the, their testimonies, the, their stories that they are sharing with us. You've received a, a video when you received the link for, for this video that you're watching now. Uh, we included a video that just just lets you hear from them and lets you hear what God is 
has been doing in their lives and the ways that they're responding to him by now taking this step of, of obedience with baptism. I hope you're going to be blessed just by watching and, and listening to what they share and just their example that they're, they're giving for, for us as a church. And then later today at 3 o'clock at Elkton Valley Campground, you're all invited to come out and be at the campground for, to, to just witness and observe their, uh, their, their baptism later today. We're going to baptize them in the river there. There's a lot of space, a big, big um, area there where you can stand and be distanced from others. And if you'd like to come, we're going to be outside the whole time. We're not going to be in the building like we've done in the past. There is a washroom building there as well. I think it'll be a great time. And if it works for you to come and be part of it, I, I expect that you'll leave that feeling very blessed and, and glad that you were able to be there. One other thing I want to just mention to you as you prepare for next Sunday, for the, the next uh, weekend that we're going to have together, we're planning to have a communion time in our service and as part of this video in our, in our service next weekend. And so I just want to let you know that so that you can prepare. You don't need to have uh, something fancy or anything special. Uh, just some, some juice, a piece of bread or a cookie or something like that, a cracker, anything like that would be fine. And uh, I'll lead you through that communion time. And, uh, but that'll be part of our service next weekend. And I wanted to, to just make sure I gave you some time to prepare and be ready for that. But we're gonna, next, we're going to do something that's just, just kind of fun. I, I want you to hear a, a song that some might be familiar to a lot of you. And so in a moment, you're going to just push pause on this video so that you can click on the link and, uh, and listen to this next video. And then come right back and we'll continue talking together. Well, if you have heard that song before, and if you can sing along to the words, then then that means you're really old. <laughs> that, that song was recorded back in, in 1965. How many of you knew that that song was, was taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 3? Um, the, the, the band, the birds, they recorded that song, and they used the original King James Version of Ecclesiastes 3 as the lyrics for, for their song. That, that song that you just listened to, it reached number one on the Billboard charts back in 1965, and it stayed at number one for 11 weeks. Can you imagine a song being written today that only used scripture or, or only used the King James Version of the lyrics? Uh, do you think that song would reach number one <laughs> on our Billboard charts today? It's hard to imagine that, isn't it? Well, I want to carry on this morning with the next chapter from our series in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Even though we just listened in that song to, to most of Ecclesiastes 3, or a good part of Ecclesiastes 3, let, let me just read those first eight verses for you. Um, these are probably the most well-known verses in the entire book of Ecclesiastes. They're the ones that we, we often hear the most frequently. So let's read them together. Ecclesiastes 1, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 says, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Well, those words were written by a man whose name was Solomon. Solomon, he was someone who had everything going for him. But he realized that all of the money, all of the fame, all the power, all the sex, all the possessions that he owned, they, they were all just meaningless in the end. They, they didn't fill that void that was inside of him that was searching for, for true meaning and true purpose to his life. So Solomon, he made it his, his life mission to find true satisfaction and meaning and purpose 
in this life. He, he tried everything that a person could try under the sun, and in the end, he discovered that life made sense when it was accepted as a gift that was given to us from God. Our, our lives find meaning and purpose when we enjoy what God has given and, and enjoy the blessings that he has generously offered to us. Well, here in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, in those verses we just read, Solomon takes a step back from his own personal journey in this, this quest that he's on to reflect on the big picture, uh, this, to, to, to kind of take a step back and, and view uh, the entire big picture of the human life and the human experience. And as he takes a step back, he, he sees that life has this, this series of rhythms and patterns and seasons to it. Life is filled with changes. The things that we experience, they're temporary. And, and often we can swing from, from one season to the other in a very short amount of time. I want to just share a few thoughts about this poem, these first eight verses with you. It's it's really one of the most well-written and insightful poems that you're ever going to come across. The, the first observation is, is the emphasis that this poem places on seasons and on changes in our lives. Um, our lives are, are always filled with changes and, and with new seasons. Of course, we, we can see this in, in nature around us all the time. We see that uh, when we look out the window right now with the different seasons of fall and winter and spring and summer. Uh, we, experience this we experience changes and new seasons as we age and as we get older or as our children grow up and as they get older. Well, just as there are seasons in nature and there are seasons and rhythms that we experience at a, at a very personal level, um, we, we don't just stay in, in, in one place forever. Things are always changing. Things are always shifting, and we're, we're kind of being moved from, from one season and one time and one, one place to the next. This idea of seasons or changes in life, it, it isn't new to us. I, I once heard someone use some interesting words to describe the, the different seasons of life. They said that the life is filled with spills, drills, thrills, bills, ills, pills, and wills. If you unpack that, this person, he said that our first 10 years of life are filled with spills. And then the, between age 10 to 20, our, our life is filled with a lot of drills. Between age 20 and 30, there are a lot of thrills. Between 30 and 40, we experience a lot of bills. Uh, from 40 to, 50, 40 to 50, we start to have some ills. From 50 to 60, we need a lot of pills. And when we're older than that, uh, that's when we start to focus on our wills. <laughs> um, our lives, they are always changing. We move from one season to the next. Each of those seasons, they're temporary and they're brief. And then we, we shift and we move to the next one. We, we don't stay in the same place or in the same season forever. And Solomon would, would actually say that, that this is a good thing, that it's a good thing. There's something good and there's something beneficial about changes and about new seasons in life. Uh, God designed our world and God designed our lives this way. Overall, it is a good thing that we can experience these changes and, and we can move from one season to another. It's, it's a good thing. C can you imagine if it was a time to plant but then there was never a time to harvest what you had just planted. That would not be good. That, that would kind of be like last year with the farmers and their harvest when there was snow covering all the fields. All, all their harvest was buried under snow. They, they planted, but they couldn't harvest, and it wasn't good. What if there was a time for war, but there was never going to be a time for peace? That wouldn't be good. What if there was a time where Everything was being torn down, but there was never a time to build back up. You know, God, he designed our world and he designed our lives for change. There's this necessary balance between these opposite extremes that Solomon's describing here. Change can be good, and God designed it this way. 
you might look at some of these words that I've read and that Solomon wrote and wonder, well, well how could those be good? How, how could those be something good in our lives? How, how could it be good to die? Well, well, death can be a beautiful thing. It can be a precious thing from God's perspective. Psalm 116 verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. You might say, well, well, how can it be good to hate? How could hate be something good? Well, the Bible says that, that it's a good thing, and it's, it's something we should strive for, to hate those things that are evil. That's from Romans 12, verse 9. Well, when, when could war, something like war and fighting and conflict, be a good thing? Well, the, guy, the Bible guides us to stand and to fight against Satan and against his evil forces. We should also be fighting against injustice and oppression and wickedness in our world. God designed us and he designed our world to experience changes in different seasons. And they can all be good. They can all be healthy. They can all be beautiful in their own time. Well, this is a bit of a rabbit trail here, but, but, but this would have been a big deal. Uh, what I'm going to share next to the Israelites that were that we're reading and, and hearing this for the first time. Each line of this poem that, that we've read, verses 1 to 8, each line of this poem has a pair of opposites, these, these two phrases. And there are 14 pairs altogether. That, that makes, makes 28 different descriptions that are given to us. The number 28 can be broken down into four groups of seven. And for the Hebrews, seven was the number of perfection, and that was a big deal to them, this number seven. And any time they could break something down into these sevens. It, it was a number that represented God's perfect design and God's perfect will. They would have thought that way as they read these verses. The sevens that are in this poem and the way they could break that down, that, that would have helped them to see that there is something that is perfect and something that is good and beautiful in the way that God designed our world and God designed our lives for these new seasons and these different changes that we experience. Well, well that kind of just points us to the next observation uh, from these first eight verses. And that's just this, that, that we, we are rarely in control of the changes and the new seasons that we experience. And that is the hard part of change for us. We don't control when we will experience things like grieving or crying or tearing apart or fighting in a war. Uh, we're, those things are out of our control most of the time. Right now, COVID means that we can't embrace. It's, it's a time to refrain from embracing and, and that's out of our control right now and we don't like it. Well, this poem is, is meant to reveal how helpless we are to these different changes and seasons in life. We could be laughing one day and we could be crying the next day. We could embracing someone that we love and then turning away from them just a few days later. We could be dancing today and we could be grieving tomorrow. We know that this is true and that this is real life because we've all experienced this happening to us where these seasons, these changes, they come and it's out of our control. And that is the reason we don't like change, because, because it reminds us that we aren't in control. It, it reminds us that we're finite and that we're small and that we're vulnerable and we're often quite helpless. And we don't like thinking of ourselves that way at all. So Ecclesiastes 3 reminds us that, that life doesn't often go the way that we had planned or, or even the way that we wanted. We wish that our lives would be, would be only filled with good things, all the time. We want a problem-free, debt-free, stress-free, trouble-free kind of life. But that is not reality, and that's not the reality that Solomon wrote about. That's not the way that it is. The truth is that, that we have very little say in what we will experience and what we will walk through in our lives. You know, overall, when you look at these eight verses... This poem, it, it wants us to understand that, that life is filled with joy and also with pain. 
with blessings and with challenges, with victories and defeats, with, with good times and bad times. This is true for our relationships, for our health, for our work and our labor, the, the things we, we work on. It's true for our families. Everything that we experience between our time to be born and our time to die is going to be uh, living in between the things that are good, the things that are blessed, the things that are hard, the things that are difficult. Let's just carry on to the next part of Ecclesiastes 3. I want to read verses 9 to verse 17 with you next. And uh, and then we're going to talk about them together. Verse 9 says, What do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden that God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So I concluded there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. What is happening now has happened before. And what will happen in the future has happened before. Because God makes the same things happen over and over again. Verse 16, I I also noticed that under the sun there is evil in the courtroom. Yes, even the courts of law are corrupt. I said to myself, in due season... God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. Well, back uh, back several years ago, I, I used to work at a church in Calgary called Bonavista Church. That was before I came here and started working at Bethel. <clears throat> and when I was at Bonavista Church, I served under a pastor whose name was Murray Swalm. And I'm so grateful for the time that I had working with him. It was a w- wonderful gift in my life and helped me grow so much. And in our conversations that Murray and I would have, he would sometimes talk about about the need for a velvet hammer, a velvet hammer, uh, how, how that was needed in certain situations. See, just for a minute, just imagine a hammer that is lined in velvet. Just picture that for a moment. The velvet is soft and comforting and, and gentle, But the hammer itself can be hard and violent and painful. Uh, Murray would talk about a velvet hammer when he was talking about parenting or kids or or leadership or or about following Jesus in the way that sometimes God uh, works in our lives. He was talking about those times when we need to offer maybe tough love or receive tough love, when our our love compels us to give, give a hard consequence or a strong challenge to someone. Or to receive that. But, but at the same time, it's also offered in a way that is loving and gentle and, and caring. There's this, there's this gentleness involved, but also this firmness at the same time. A velvet hammer means that something can be both hard and challenging for us, but also good and also comforting for us. Well, these verses that I just read, uh, verses 9 to 17... They are, the, they are the velvet hammer of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The, there are words here that challenge us in a way that is meant to be hard and firm and even a little bit painful. But there are also words here that are, that are meant to be caring and comforting and gentle to us. So let me try to explain the, the challenging comfort of Ecclesiastes verses 9 to 17 that we just read. Let's just start with this challenge, with the challenge of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So Solomon, he just wrote this this beautiful, timeless, epic poem, verses 1 to 8. It's sung in songs, it's it's read at funerals, it's, uh, it's this beautiful poem. He did an amazing job of capturing the human experience, the good and the bad, the, the changes that we experience from season to season, the beauty and also the pain of, of these rhythms and these places that we find ourselves as we travel from birth to death. But then here in verse 9, he pulls out the hammer and he hits us in verse 9. What do people really get? 
what do they gain from all their hard work? What, what do people gain from all these seasons, from all these activities, from all these experiences in life? You can live a life that is filled with laughter and with grief, with dancing and with collecting and embracing and with peace and tearing and harvesting and collecting. All of these rich and full and, and real experiences. But then in verse 9, Solomon says, all of it was meaningless. It didn't matter. Uh, nothing was gained by any of that. According to Solomon, our lives can be filled with, with good things and with bad things, with joy and with pain, with blessings and challenges. But at the end of our lives, none of it really matters all that much. After building everything up so beautifully in these first eight verses, verse 9 just comes and hits us like a sucker punch. What do you mean, Solomon? None of it matters. What do you mean that nothing is gained from the life that I've lived? Those first eight verses, they are beautiful, but, but a large collection of life experiences is not enough to bring a lasting meaning and satisfaction to our lives. Our experiences, these seasons that we walk through, they can't save us. They are temporary. They don't last. We live our lives in, in all of these changes and all of these seasons that we experience, and then we die. And when you're dead, it, it doesn't really matter if life was filled with laughter or with crying, because you're still going to be dead in, this, in the end. One life, one person's life could be filled with dancing. Another person's life could be filled with grief. But both will, be, both will still end up dead, buried and eventually forgotten. Nothing is gained by all of these experiences. None of it lasts. It's all meaningless. If the purpose of our lives to, was to have diverse experiences and, and to adapt to new seasons and to manage the changes that, that life throws at us, then, then we'd be okay and we'd be fine. But that's not what life is all about. That's not the purpose of our lives. My life experiences are not enough to save me. Something more is still needed. Verses 1 to 8, they describe these, these various times of life in, in a beautiful, in a very poetic way. But then the velvet hammer of verses 9 to 7 reminds us that the times of my life, my experiences, these times of my life are not the only times that there are. There is a time to be born, there is a time to die, and then there is a time for judgment. The, the seasons and the changes of our lives, they're, they're going to come to an end one day. And in light of eternity, our lives and these seasons and the ex these experiences, they are all brief. They are all temporary. They're short. We can live a life that's filled with dancing and with love and laughter and peace and embracing and building. But when we take our last breath, that's it. It's all over. It's all done. We, we can't take any of that with us. Those aren't the things that are going to save us when we stand before God, our judge. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. And then there's a time for judgment. Verse 11 says, God has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. The end that Solomon is talking about is not our death. It's that moment when we stand before God, our holy judge. And on that day, the experiences that I've had, those aren't going to save me. But my obedience to God and, and my desire to glorify him, that will matter on that day. When I stand before God, I will give an account for my words. Those things that I said that I shouldn't have said. Those times that I was silent, but I, I should have spoken up. God was watching me in those moments. God remembers how I used my words. Um, God remembers those times when I allowed hate to grow and to fester in my heart. God remembers that. That time that I caused someone to cry or caused someone to grieve, God was watching that moment. 
that time when someone apologized and, and was ready to embrace, but I turned away and I refused to embrace, God saw that. That tor- time that I tore someone down with my self-righteous attitude, God was watching and he remembers that. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die, and then there's a time for judgment. God will judge me and he will judge you. Verses four and verse 14 and verse 17 say, whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added or, or taken away from it. In due season, God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. So my life, it's, a, it's about a lot more than just, just collecting experiences and moments and, and seasons and changes. My life is about a lot more than that. And, and just filling my life with those things before I die, that's, that's not really the point. Life is about preparing for eternity and preparing for God's judgment. By, by choosing to fear and obey God and his instructions, that's, that's where, what life is about. That matters far more than, than anything else that we can experience or, or walk through in this very brief life. We will all give an account for our lives and, and stand before God one day and receive his perfect ju- judgment. Well, that, that's the challenge of this passage, these verses, these final verses. But here's the comfort. Here's the comfort of these verses, the, the velvet part of the velvet hammer. The comfort is that God is, God is just and God is good. The comfort is that God is just and God is good. God is perfectly just. When we stand before God, he will see every action and choice and thought and attitude that we've ever had at any time. And at that moment, they will have a profound meaning. I can't change what I've done or I can't add to it anymore after I'm dead and and standing before God. What is past is past, but what is past is not forgotten to God. God will examine our lives, what we've done and what we haven't done, what we've suffered from others, but also the ways that we have caused others to suffer. God will see all of these things. He won't miss anything. And then he's going to act. He's going to move forward with perfect justice. And as believers, as followers of Jesus, we should view this as a good thing. Not a bad thing, not something to be afraid of. God's judgment of over our world, it's a good thing. God's judgment means that there is a day still coming when wrongs will be made right when justice will be delivered, and when every single thing that's happened will have its day in court. On judgment day, God will dial back time, reach into the past, and bring every action into account. You know, we can look at our own personal lives and and remember all of these precious moments that we've experienced. You know, I can remember dancing I can remember dancing with my wife Coralie on our wedding day. I can remember embracing and and holding my children moments after they were born. I I remember times of laughing with my brothers and with my friends. I I remember God building me up to pastoral ministry. That was something I I never thought I would ever do. I, I remember those quiet moments where God was close and I experienced his grace in ways that just transformed my life. I remember so many good moments. They, they came and they went. I won't ever live them again. They happened and then they were gone. But I can also remember some other seasons of my life. Times that, and memories that were not so good, not so pleasant. Times when I found myself attacked by others. Times when someone stole something that belonged to me. Times when someone lied to me. Times when someone falsely accused me. Times when someone betrayed me or hurt me. I can remember all of those things. I remember all of those, and so does God. And because God is just, then I can also know that a day is coming when his justice 
will prevail. Verse 16 says that our worldly court systems, the court systems of our world, our world, those are going to fail and those are going to falter. But God's justice can't be stopped. It can't be stopped. Every single thing that has happened to me or to you will have its day in court one day where the righteous and the perfect judgment of God will be handed out. An author, his name is David Gibson, he explains it like this. He says, God will retrieve every single injustice and every single time and every single activity, every single deed that has ever broken his holy law and tarnished his beautiful world and damaged his image bearers. Every one of those moments will be answerable to God. Every tear and every sighing sorrow for my wrongs, whether through things I have done or had done to me, each one will be sought out by the God who is perfect justice, truth, mercy, and love. If you are walking through a season right now in your life where things seem unfair, where you are being mistreated, where the hurts of your past have a power over you, where those who have harmed you aren't really facing any consequences for what they've done, then I want you to just hear again that that they will have their day in heaven's court. And the judge will be God himself, and his justice will be perfect. So God is just, and, and this should comfort us. But we're also comforted to know that God is good, that God is good. God has shown us his goodness by providing us with a savior for those who are under his judgment. And that includes me and that includes you. People have sinned against us and they will give an account for that one day. But we have also sinned against others and we've sinned against God. And we must face the consequence of that too. But in his incredible goodness, God gave his son, Jesus, so that we can be forgiven and clean on the day of our judgment. On the cross, Jesus took the judgment that was meant for me. Jesus took my sin and my mistakes, my failures and my wrong choices. He took all of those things upon himself when he was crucified on the cross. When I accepted Christ into my life, I accepted his gift of redemption. He he substituted his life for mine. He paid the penalty for my sin. He faced the consequence and he took the judgment that I deserved. Because of this, because this is true, I have nothing to fear on judgment day. In Jesus, I have assurance of my salvation. Romans 8 verse 1 says, So now... There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. This gift of grace and mercy is offered to all who will accept Christ into their lives, who will turn away from their sin, and who will follow and live in the ways of Jesus. You can receive this same assurance for your salvation by inviting Christ into your life, by accepting this gift of Jesus into your life by asking for his forgiveness for those things that you've done that are wrong, and then by obeying his instructions, by these instructions that he's given us for life in his word. You know, it, it is God who holds my life in his hands. He is writing this story with all these seasons and all these changes and all these experiences. Um, he's writing all of, all of my story. I'm not the author, he is. My life, it belongs to him. My purpose is to glorify him and to obey him. Whether I face grief or face laughter, whether I face war or dancing, uh, hatred or healing, he holds my past and my present and my future in his everlasting arms. My experiences, all these things I experience in my life, they don't matter as much as my obedience and my devotion to God does. And when I stand before him, I have nothing to fear because Jesus is my savior and God's justice has already been served. That can be your assurance and your confidence 
as you realize and remember that there's a day to be born, there's a day to die, and there's also a time for God's judgment. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this, these ways that you guide and lead us through life, through all these different seasons and changes that we experience. Lord, uh, there's so much of life that it's out of our control, and we end up in places sometimes that are very hard and very difficult. And we're so grateful that you are with us at every point and at every step. And, and no matter what we're facing, there are these ways that, <clears throat> that we can worship you and glorify you and obey you in how we respond. And thank you for this reminder today that it isn't our experiences. It isn't this collection of life, life experiences and life changes, those those aren't the things that are going to matter when we stand before you. It's what, what is going to matter on that day is, is our response to Jesus Christ and, and our position before you because of him. So I thank you that you are just and that, that we, can, we can anticipate and understand the way that all the wrongs in our world will be made right one day and, and that all, all things that have happened will, will be held, held accountable for what, what, what has taken place but we also thank you that you're good, that you've offered us your son as our savior, as our, uh, as our redeemer, the one who has substituted his life for mine and for ours. Lord, I pray that, that if there are any who are watching this video who are not sure where they stand before you, that they would, they would take that step of just inviting you into their life right now to just, just talk to you the way I'm talking right now, to, to speak out to you and to invite you into their life to ask forgiveness for those things they've done wrong and then to make that commitment to, to follow you and to obey your instructions. Um, Lord, thank you that when we do that, that we have this, this assurance that on Judgment Day that, um, that it's not our past failures that you'll, that you'll focus on. It's, it's our, our relationship with Jesus that will matter and that will carry us forward into this permanent place of joy and goodness for eternity with you. Lord, I pray your blessing on all those who are watching this video. I, I, I don't know everyone's story, but I just imagine that there are some who are walking through some big challenges and all of this stuff with COVID, it brings a whole new level of worry and anxiety and challenge into our lives right now. I pray for your grace to be poured out on each person who's watching today. I pray they would know your love and and those from our church, I just pray they would know that the love that, that we have for them and the ways that uh, we continue to just celebrate the way that you bind us together through Jesus Christ. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.